But the profound effects on clinical practice have been in the realm of viral diagnostics, non-pharmaceutical interventions, and the mRNA, mRNA vaccines. And I'm just going to touch upon this very briefly here. We had this emergen, uh, emergence of incredible widespread population testing by mid-February of 2021. So basically a year into the pandemic, we had done more PCR tests in this country than the entire U.S. population. Uh, in Dane County, we had over 5 million PCR tests performed. And we also have this emergent of widespread use of self-testing. Whenever I give talks to students, uh, others, and ask for a show of hand, everybody has self-tested. Uh, and this is something that is very, very different. This technology is continuing. Uh, this came out uh, just last week, the authorization of a at-home COVID and flu combo test. So we're going to see more and more of these products uh, come along, particularly when we have things that there are treatments for. And I want to just spend a little time with this. Uh, Bruce had mentioned our orchard study down in the Oregon School District. The black line here represents, going all the way back to early December 2019, the number of cases of acute respiratory tract infection hitting our target population. We had about 800 individuals and 200 households recruited for this. And so if you just follow that black line, it shows the community level of respiratory tract infections. And there were interventions that happened in the school district. So initially they shut things down in March of 2020 and respiratory viruses and infections plummeted. When schools opened, or I'm sorry, when the summer vacation began and people started acting maybe a little more normally, infections actually went up. That's kind of a rare thing uh, that we see. Uh, when the schools reopened in the fall of 2020 with hybrid education, physical distancing, and masking, there was absolutely no increase in respiratory infections in the community. At the end of that year though, when kids came out of school, there was a significant increase. When kids came back in the fall of 2021 with masking but no distancing, there was a very large increase in respiratory tract infections. And when masking uh, was made optional in March, it did not increase respiratory infections. This time we had uh, no effect to summer vacation. And then when we got back to what I would call a fairly normal year, we had a large increase again with no masking and distancing. So this is some of the best evidence we have for what was being done in schools having profound effects on the community. The mRNA vaccines came out and by mid-March of 2024, the number of doses that had been provided across the globe was over 13 billion. But as we see all the time, great disparities, especially when we look at Sub-Saharan Africa um, and other poor countries, uh, distribution was not very equal. And I'm gonna just plant a seed here that in the United States, we are a little bit lighter color than uh, Canada. Uh, we had a phenomenal vaccine that by April of 2021, uh, we could not really even give it away. Uh, people stopped accepting the vaccine. This will come back uh, uh, at a later time. I'm gonna just give a little bit of respiratory virus and pathogen basics out here. If we look at our data from the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health, over time, these are time series that go all the way back to 2007, starting in July. And what we see in terms of overall respiratory infections, kind of the top panel in yellow, is low in the summertime, high in the wintertime, back down low. It looks like a saw blade up until you hit this time with the red arrow, which is the pandemic. And for a year, things really went away and then slowly rebounded. 
The bottom panel is the same data, except with a 100 degree filter put on. So these are patients with a 100 degree filter at the time of visit as measured. And same type of thing, but this data is much more suggestive of influenza. And again, we see during the first year of pandemic, uh, influenza really went away. When we start looking at individual viruses out there, which we did through our orchard study, we found that uh, this is over about an eight and a half year period. Uh, influenza A predictably is a uh, late fall, early winter virus. Influenza B tends to follow a little bit behind influenza A. RSV has a long period of distribution, and this will come back later when we talk about vaccine. And then SARS-CoV-2 has been detected virtually year round, but I think this is gonna be changing uh, over the next uh, few years. If we look at our Department of Family Medicine Community Health patients and ask the question, what percent of visits at various ages are due to respiratory infections? Well, it turns out that respiratory infections are really a childhood disease that are intermittently spread to older people. But if we take a look at one to two and three to four year olds, almost one in five visits uh, in our department at those age groups are for respiratory infections. Uh, also school age children have a fairly high level that amazing age of five, or five through 17. And then just to finish up here, the regular visitors in primary care practice, we see a lot of influenza. This is A and B combined, followed by rhinovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, the seasonal coronaviruses, human metanumavirus, perinfluenza, adeno. And uh, SARS is pretty low there, but that's only because it's a new kid on the block. And this data goes all the way back to 2009. And so SARS is artificially reduced there. Now, this is something that uh, just did with a high school student, actually the son of uh, our former resident, uh, Jay Wong, who's now a family doc out in, in Portland. But we looked at data from our clinics and data from orchards, restricting it to children, and asked the question, are there differences between what we see in the community and what we see in the clinic? And in fact, influenza A and B are much more likely to be seen in clinic than what we see in the community. So overrepresented in a clinical setting. Likewise, adenovirus and atypical bacteria are overrepresented in our clinical practices. Conversely, SARS-CoV-2 in children, rhinovirus, enterovirus, and seasonal coronaviruses are underrepresented. And I think one of the things to keep in mind that SARS-CoV-2 is not a real big pathogen in young people. Uh, we don't see the level of hospitalization, ICU care, and death in kids that we do in adults. So uh, again, for most kids, it's a pretty benign illness and doesn't bring kids into the uh, clinical practice. Finally, and this goes back to before the pandemic time, but if we look at what we find in long-term care facilities, congregate living settings, about 70% of the viruses are what I would call the more high consequence. So influenza, human metanumavirus, and RSV. These are all viruses that are associated with uh, significant morbidity and mortality in uh, elders and frail individuals. So I'm gonna pivot over to talk about RSV something that we all are familiar with, we see a lot in our practices. Uh, and just as a reminder, transmission is primarily through respiratory droplets and by surface. We can have viable RSV on a surface for several hours. And one of the recurring themes is sneezing and coughing within three or four feet of somebody else uh, sets the stage for more easy transmission through respiratory droplets. Uh, I don't think we need to go over the symptoms. We know that other than the fact that this is a virus that uh, 
I usually refer to as having the uh, green 11 sign in children, and it's the two streaks of green stuff coming down from their nostrils. It's significant in the level of respiratory distress in the infants and young children, and I'm also going to toss out into older people with COPD and asthma. Uh, most of us who have done hospital practice are familiar with the patients uh, COPD that come in uh, midwinter time, and uh, they're being treated maximally for their COPD. Uh, eventually, we throw them on antibiotic for a community acquired pneumonia. Uh, oftentimes, we throw uh, diuretics at them for congestive heart failure. They don't get better. Finally, after about two weeks, they go off to uh, a rehab facility. Uh, a lot of those cases are actually RSV. The incubation period is anywhere from two to eight days. Uh, symptoms usually lasting uh, three to eight days long. We can be infectious, you know, uh, before onset uh, to about eight days after, but infants notoriously shed this virus for a long time, up to a month after infection. And just a reminder, two to 3% of all infants in the pre-monoclonal antibody era uh, were hospitalized in the first year, year of life. Um, the highest risk uh, for hospitalization occurs actually in the first few months of life, and I always look at this as being very size dependent. And most of the kids who are hospitalized, almost 80%, are healthy children without any underlying medical condition. So a, a big, big player there, especially in the wintertime, and our residents on uh, pediatrics. In Wisconsin, we tend to see RSV occurring primarily between November and April, uh, but really peaking out typically in late January or early February, as shown in this histogram here. These are uh, uh, old positive culture data from the State Lab of Hygiene. Prevention, and this is where uh, things are changing, oops, sorry about that, changing uh, fairly rapidly. We now have a viable vaccine, uh, actually two vaccines, and the current recommendation is for everybody age 75 and older to receive a single dose. Uh, it can e either be the Pfizer or the GSK product. We also recommend routinely for high-risk individuals, for example, COPD, uh, between the age of 60 and 74. This vaccine is not required by UW Health for practitioners or clinicians. And uh, uh, also recommended in pregnancy, uh, regardless of age, at 32 through 36 weeks of gestation, but only if the newborn monoclonal antibody is not planned to be used or not available. But uh, it provides relatively good protection over the first few uh, three to four months of life, protecting the newborn. Now, I'm, I put the exclamation point on the monoclonal antibody for in all infants. This has been an incredibly effective treatment. This is uh, just a IM injection, and it provides several months of protection. And in the preliminary year, uh, we're finding an 84% vaccine or monoclonal antibody effectiveness for prevention of hospitalization due to RSV. This is important because we don't really have any treatments uh, other than supportive care, oxygen and bronchodilators, uh, sometimes uh, tube feeding for infants, and uh, otherwise for other people, mild, moderate, it's symptomatic treatment only. I'm going to spend just a little bit more here. Um, with the adult vaccine, the real world effectiveness seen in the first year uh, has been about 75%, which is actually higher than the data we saw from the manufacturers in terms of their randomized control trials. So we're seeing good efficacy, uh, and we're also seeing this lasting two to three years uh, in the individuals who were in the clinical trials. 
So we don't know if there's going to be a revaccination, but as of yet, it's a one-time uh, dose, and we'll revisit uh, future doses as more data is generated. In Wisconsin, about 20% of people over the age of 60 have received RSV vaccine, 30% in Dane County. But I want to call the attention to the disparities we see between black and white. In Dane County, it's actually worse than across the state uh, by about nine points. Uh, Asians, fairly low. Uh, our Alaska Native uh, American Indian population actually uh, relatively high. Uh, and a lot of that is due to uh, uh, effects of Indian Health Service and uh, outreach to communities. The maternal RSV vaccine is for anyone who's pregnant. Uh, it's Pfizer vaccine only, 32 through 36 weeks, uh, September through January. Uh, this can be done in uh, primary care clinics, and it protects the infant. The nirsevimab, which is the monoclonal antibody, this is for infants who are eight months uh, and younger whose mother did not receive the vaccine. Uh, it's a one-time IM injection, uh, preferably in the first week of life or as the child's entering the RSV season, which is October through March. Best if it's provided at birthing hospitals, uh, and it does do a phenomenal job of protecting infants. A little bit more, uh, these are from the Bureau of Communicable Disease, uh, DHS here in Wisconsin, but just a graphic showing the uh, times of the year that the vaccine should be provided, that's September through January to protect the infant after birth. The nirsevimab is October 1st through March 31st. And then finally, this is something that is, uh, the, the dosing is weight dependent. So under five kilos, 50 milligrams or 0.5 cc, over five kilos, 100 milligrams. Uh, and then older children who are at high risk coming into a second season can receive 200 uh, milligram. I'll just mention very quickly, uh, last week at Wingra, uh, we had a infant under five kilos receive 100 uh, milligrams. Uh, people were distraught and my response was, oh, you're gonna be uh, pretty well protected this year. Uh, but there's really very, very little harm in that. It just isn't necessary. SARS-CoV-2, boy, we've all lived and breathed this for so long. Um, again, coughing and sneezing, highly infectious, and as time has gone on, it's become more and more transmittable, um, are more, more likely to be transmitted for somebody who has no protection. And the symptoms keep on changing. One of the things that just came out uh, was a paper uh, in the last week looking at long COVID. And I just want to mention that down at the bottom, I have as 10% of the cases with chronic symptoms using uh, artificial intelligence and fine tuning algorithms. The uh, study indicated that it's actually more like 20% of people can have long COVID. And so we just have to kind of wait and see how that pans out. But usually symptoms last for seven days or less uh, incubation period of two to six days. And the transmission is most likely in the first few days, but can extend out to about 10 days. Our team did, uh, it just published this uh, last month, looking at transmission in households in Dane County. And what we found was the overall secondary infection rate within household was about 47%. So that's about double of influenza. Uh, but what we really found as interesting in, is in the pre-Delta phase, it was 72%. During Delta, it dropped down to 21 or 51. The Omicron uh, had dropped down to 41, even though it was more biologically transmissible. But this was the effect of uh, prior infection and vaccination. Uh, in Oregon, we hit 78% of our kids. Um, and uh, also, household behavior, uh, masking, uh, quarantine, and so on. We did find a big uh, 
effect of the household density. Uh, that was really the only factor that seemed to lend itself to transmission. The index case age, severity, and individual symptoms were not associated with odds of household transmission. And the cat in the corner, we had actually had data so we could uh, look at cat ownership because that had been theoretically proposed as a possible factor for household transmission. And the good news is cats were not associated with household transmission. All right. So uh, if you take a look at the bottom left figure, that is a figure of the deaths due to COVID uh, over the entire period up until present. And what I want to show here is that uh, especially by uh, 23, 24, we were getting a pattern of a small hump in late summertime and a big hump in winter. So we're seeing two peaks per year. CDC has done uh, studies of this and sure enough, there appear to be two uh, peaks at this point in time, a lesser one in the summertime, a greater one in the wintertime. If we look at percent positivity, that's on the right-hand side here in the orange, uh, we see similar levels of percent positivity. But keep in mind, percent positivity isn't the number of cases. It's dependent on the number of tests being done. Our projections going forward is in our decreasing hospitalization over time and also decreasing deaths over time. Uh, so the good news is I think we're seeing this becoming more and more endemic and less and less uh, novel. Uh, we're getting used to this virus. I'll just mention also this can change on a dime, as Bruce alluded to early on with anything in terms of respiratory viruses. SARS-CoV-2 has a high rate of change and mutation. And so, for example, the red box here indicates the variant that was used to make this year's vaccine, uh, KP2. And as you can see, KP2 has largely disappeared, being replaced by other variants. So uh, this is a constantly moving target, and it's really hard to predict uh, where we should go with, with vaccines. The vaccines, however, are effective, even though they're not a perfect match, and they are safe. Uh, what we're finding is uh, we continue to see significant reductions in death, hospitalization, and long COVID with vaccines. And our vaccines are now going to be are being deployed on an annual basis. We have three antivirals, uh, Paxlovid, Molipiravir, and Remdesivir. Uh, the two oral agents have to be started within five days, uh, remdesivir within seven days, but these are for either people hospitalized or with COVID and a high likelihood of hospitalization. Our vaccines for COVID, uh, we have now uh, moved to the monovalent once a year for most people. Uh, it's the KP2 adapted. The current ACIP recommendations it's basically universal uh, for uh, everyone uh, age uh, above six months. If we look at other groups, so if you're 65 years or older, you qualify for a second dose six months later. So that's a full recommendation. The minimal interval is two months. This is also for people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised. And if you're immunocompromised, you actually can get a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth dose, the minimal interval being two months. But this is something that is under shared decision making. If we look at utilization Wisconsin, this year we're up to only 11% of us uh, receiving the updated vaccine. We're about double that in Dane County. And again, we see enormous disparities between white and black, uh, between non-Hispanic and Hispanic individuals. Okay, influenza, getting back to where, where I started. Uh, typical symptoms, uh, fever and cough, sore throat, runny nose. Uh, we spread this through respiratory droplets for the most part. A 
pretty short incubation period, one to three days. If I get, if I'm exposed and I get out three days, I feel that I'm in the clear. Uh, symptoms usually peak day two or three, can last up to a week, and infectiousness really drops after about five days. If we just look at the annual cycle of influenza Wisconsin, this is a virus that likes temperatures below freezing. So as we hit uh, 32 degrees or zero degrees centigrade, we tend to see influenza come up. And when we rise above that, uh, I, as an average temperature, it tends to go away. So what to expect this year? Uh, this is a graphic from Australia showing their peak of influenza in July. Uh, they had a moderate severity. So I would predict this year we're likely to have usual timing, uh, December, January, February of moderate severity as well. Um, prevention. One of the key features of the pandemic and one of the outcomes was the extinction of influenza B Yamagata. Masking and distancing brought this virus to its end. So we're now back to a trivalent vaccine. Uh, best provided in late autumn. Uh, variable effectiveness uh, for symptomatic influenza around 40%, but much better for things like hospitalization and death. Uh, it's a very safe vaccine required by UW Health. And I'll also add for people age 65 and older, they should either get, well, they should get an enhanced vaccine, so high dose or adjuvanted. Staying sick or staying home if sick, um, is worthwhile using face masking is important in healthcare settings. We have uh, three oral agents, oseltamivir, zanamivir, and baloxivir, uh, and then an IV agent, uh, paramivir. Uh, the baloxivir is a single dose. The other two are over five days, uh, but these must be initiated within about 48 hours of illness onset, though they can be used uh, with a longer latency for patients who are hospitalized. And guess what? Well, Wisconsin, we're hitting about 22% now. Dane County, again, we're higher. Um, and again, we see a lot of disparities between uh, white and black, uh, Hispanic and non-Hispanic in Wisconsin. So a quick word about influenza A, H5N1. Uh, we're seeing a steady increase in cases. Uh, last week was reported 46. Uh, my graphic up there shows the uh, transmission from birds to dairy cattle, uh, dairy cattle to dairy workers. Uh, we can find it in milk supply all across the country. Uh, pasteurized milk kills it beautifully. Uh, it's about 100% fatal in cats fed raw milk. Uh, so you find Dairy operations where they have H5N1 in the cows, they no longer have any barn cats. Um, it's a very neurotropic uh, and incredibly fast acting disease with incredibly high levels of virus in the brain tissues of dead cats. Uh, with cows, it doesn't tend to kill them, uh, but it will tend to affect their milk production for the rest of the, the cow's life, they think. I uh, get a lot of uh, scarring in the uh, mammary tissue. Just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, this is from this morning, Canadian teen in critical condition with H5N1. Uh, this is in British Columbia. Uh, World Health Organization last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, and just a reminder, the case fatality rate for H5N1 in humans has been 54%. Uh, on our own campus here with uh, 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 Yoshi Kawaka, uh, looking at the transmissibility of a human isolate from con conjunctival uh, secretion uh, found to be highly transmissible and highly lethal in animal models. Uh, they were using ferrets and five out of six infected ferrets died. Uh, so just kind of keep this in mind, especially when we look at some of the things that's happening in the country. Um, we have a five county health department in Idaho that has been uh, prohibited from administering COVID-19 vaccines by their uh, governing board. Um, we have our dairy operations across the country that are refusing to allow USDA and public health onto their property. Um, 
you know, uh, we're cutting public health funding. Uh, we're endorsing people who are anti-vaccine. And maybe the most frightening one, uh, global pandemic treaty negotiations to conclude by May. Uh, the uh, next administration is likely to pull the United States out of any pandemic uh, uh, treaties. And this is coming at perhaps a not good time. Gonna move over a little bit to diagnosis real quickly. Um, term coming from the Greek gnosis, meaning knowledge. And I just want to mention, we have a lot of different tools out there. Rapid antigen tests are really nice and quick, uh, less than 15 minutes. They're highly specific, but they suffer a little bit in sensitivity. The uh, molecular assays and PCR uh, can be quick to longer, but tend to be highly specific and highly sensitive. And we can get these as monoplexes or as uh, multiplex i.e. a lot of different uh, analytes. Work that we did, uh, we were able to use a really large uh, amount of data we had collected, and we were able to show that uh, for rapid testing, uh, age matters, the older you get, the sensitivity declines, the longer you are from onset, sensitivity will decline. Uh, if you have ILI, so fever and another respiratory symptom, it increases, uh, the likelihood, especially if the patient has fever, and if you have a runny nose, you have increased likelihood or uh, increased sensitivity. If you're infected with a non-influenza virus, along with flu, it decreases the sensitivity. And we found really nothing affected the specificity because they're very that's very, very high. When we use rapid testing in congregate living uh, settings, so we, uh, published this paper looking at long-term care. What we found with very, very early detection of influenza in a nursing home, we saw a 38% increase in antiviral use for prophylaxis, and we saw decreases in emergency room visits, hospitalizations, uh, and hospital length of stay. Uh, throughout the study period. So if you're a, a, a director of a nursing home, keep in mind the possibility of using some early detection method for influenza. So my quick summary here is just our uh, three pathogens, influenza, RSV, and SARS-CoV-2. These are all pretty high risk to healthcare personnel. Uh, we can prevent with good use of PPE and RSV, surface decontamination. Vaccines are available for all three, and we have effective medicines for influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Just going to turn my attention real quickly to situational awareness, and this is where we have the ability to perceive, understand, and effectively respond to our situation. And how do we keep track? Well. I like to say when we're dealing with respiratory symptoms, it's mostly viruses, but keep in mind it could be bad air quality. So I have to throw this in. Uh, this has become part one of my tools for clinic. Uh, it's a free app uh, from the EPA, uh, and it can tell you uh, in real time what your air quality is like. And uh, this really came into my use when we were having a lot of smoke plumes over Wisconsin. I was seeing patients at Wingra with uh, burning, itchy eyes, uh, sore throat, a uh, mild sore throat, uh, and some congestion. And I said, eh, I think this is actually uh, the smoke in the air, the particulates. Data out there readily available uh, from State Lab of Hygiene. They have a wonderful uh, respiratory uh, virus report that comes out weekly this time of year that can give us updates on what viruses we're seeing, uh, they've added in this year uh, uh, because we're in the midst of a big pertussis outbreak, a uh, graphic on uh, the trends with pertussis. The Wisconsin Division of Public Health puts out a weekly respiratory virus surveillance report that has a lot of good information in, uh, again, with trends of various viruses. So this is uh, pretty recent. We're seeing uh, COVID or SARS go down. 
Uh, we see a lot of activity with rhinovirus, enterovirus, and a little bit of increase uh, of parainfluenza now. They also put in graphics dealing with the respiratory virus activity in emergency departments across the state that can be useful seeing what are the realized trends in actual patients. Wisconsin has the best wastewater surveillance in the country. We have a center of excellence for wastewater surveillance, and this really provides us an early warning uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Keep in mind that this is a virus that replicates wonderfully in your gut, and you excrete huge volumes uh, of virus in, uh, in your feces. And this is a allows sampling in wastewater treatment plants and the ability to project where we are and where we're going. And then if you're at Belleville, Northeast, Oregon, Verona and Winger Clinic, uh, I remind you just to uh, keep in mind you have readily available access to respiratory virus surveillance. Uh, everybody is checked for SARS-CoV-2, influenza A and B, and 17 other viruses uh, uh, free of cost to you, your clinic, and your patients. This is done for surveillance uh, in conjunction with our state lab of hygiene and with our Department of Health Services, Division of Public Health. Finally, our situational awareness, uh, Dane County has an incredible live action respiratory illness dashboard. Um, if you just Google uh, Dane County Respiratory Dashboard, this will pop up, but it provides you ongoing information on what's out there, giving you trends, uh, giving you ideas of what is in circulation at the time you're seeing a patient. So I find this can be very, very helpful in the exam room with, with patients. So final thoughts here, uh, we're not requiring distancing, masking except in patient carriers or quarantining, but we'd still recommend that people stay home and away from others until 24 hours after symptoms are getting better and they've not had a fever without uh, a fever reducing medication. So uh, we're still in that phase that uh, COVID can be pretty bad and we want to try and avoid that as po as much as possible. For those of you who are training residents, have students uh, having accommodation during periods of acute illness, uh, it's acceptable to mask, distance, and stay home. And I always say, you know, have abundant grace for yourself and your colleagues. Again, during these times of acute illness, uh, being acceptable to mask, distance, and stay home. So quick summary here. Pandemic gave us a bunch of really interesting new tools and techniques. Situational awareness is really important uh, as we approach respiratory viruses. We have rapid and accurate diagnostic tests can, can, that can help us out. Uh, we want to make sure we use antibiotics sparingly, antivirals appropriately, and prevention is always the better than treatment. So I'm gonna finish up here on a a uh, relatively dark note uh, with your forgiveness, but uh, this is a graphic of Argentina, and this is a breeding colony of southern elephant seals. Influenza A H5 and one hit uh, South America and hit uh, Argentina in October of 2023. Uh, this is the only breeding colony on the South American mainland and had a 98% death rate of the pups that year. So th basically the entire birth cohort died. Uh, the adults uh, abandoned the uh, rookery. Uh, this year, so 2024 in October, uh, only a third of them came back, uh, a third of expected. This is a virus that hits really hard, really, really fast, and can have devastating con uh, consequences. And I, I say that in perspective that we're just at the end, we're five years uh, now into COVID-19. The United States had 1.2 million deaths from COVID. Uh, more than half of those occurred after we had readily available and free vaccine. Many of our deaths for COVID were not biological, but more behavioral deaths, uh, people refusing to uh, take precautions and so on. 
If we compare the United States with uh, our peer nations, Australia or New Zealand or Norway, uh, we had a three to four times a higher death rate than those countries. So just kind of keep the, that in mind going forward when we're looking at uh, viruses out there, especially when we have a lot of warning signs now for a potentially uh, devastating virus out there that has been spread, spreading readily, uh, not only in birds, but across uh, hundreds of different mammal species. This is something that's adapted to people or to mammals, and we're seeing a little bit of spillover now into humans. So I'll finish up there. Uh, wish you all a, a wonderful day um, and happy Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks here. So.